overseers and our workers too. Thank you, Lord, for your people who are here tonight. We pray you open our heart, our spirit, our eyes, our mind to your word tonight in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord, to hear what you have for us and where we need to make correction. We pray, Lord, that your spirit will make us faithful and will make all the corrections in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name, we pray. God bless you. You can sit down tonight. We are coming to you. Some passages of scripture in the Gospels. We're looking at Matthew. We're looking at Luke. And then we come to Mark. Look at Matthew chapter 12, reading from verse 3. But he said unto them, Have ye not read what David did when he was an ungod? And they that were with him, then in verse 5, it tells us in verse 5, or have ye not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Let's come to Luke chapter 6, reading from verse 6. And it came to pass also on another Sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and he taught. And there was a man whose right hand was withered. In verse 8, it tells us, but he knew their thoughts and said unto the man which had the withered hand, rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. In verse 11, it says, And they were filled with madness. They were angry to the point of appearing to be mad. He's saying, They were filled with madness, and they commute one with another what they might do to Jesus. We're coming to Luke chapter 13, verse 16. And ought not this woman, being the daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bowed low these eighteen years, be loosed from this bondage on the Sabbath day in verse 17? It says, And when he has said these things, all his adversaries, all his enemies, all the haters of Christ, all these adversaries were ashamed, and all the people rejoiced for all the glorious things that were done by him. Mark chapter 7, reading from verse 9, And he said unto them, Full well, ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own tradition. Verse 13, making the word of God of none effect through your tradition, which ye have, which ye have delivered, and many such like things ye do. The Pharisees, uh, the Pharisees of Christ's days are gone. So there's no point castigating or blaming or judging or condemning those Pharisees. The reason we're given the scriptures and the reason we have all these accounts related to us is so that we don't fall into the same trap that they fell into. We don't fall into the same attitude that they fell into. And we do not handle the work of God like they handled the work of God. What happened to them? They had tradition the truth apart the commandment of god apart the demand of god apart the arch tradition and eventually their tradition became higher stronger than the truth of god and they abandoned christ said they forsook and they led the truth and the word of god and they held to the tradition 
Because of that, number one, they could not get saved. Because they closed their mind to Christ, lest he should speak to them and to their situation, and lest they should be healed, and lest they should be converted. Many of them died in their sicknesses because they were holding on to their tradition. They told that blind man that was born blind and who received the sight, they said, give the glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. And the man said, that I don't know. Since the world began, we have not seen a sinner opening the eyes of the blind. They said, are you going to teach us? And they drove him out of the temple. They didn't get saved. They didn't get healed. They died in their suffering, in their sickness, in their sin. Because they abandoned the truth of God and they held on to tradition. You might ask yourself, and you should ask yourself, is there any tradition you are holding to that blindfolds you to the truth of the word of God? And because of that tradition, you neglect the truth, you reject the truth, you don't believe the truth, you might know the truth. But if the tradition beclouds your understanding, then the truth will be of none effect. That's why today we're looking at this message. We're not, we're not uh, talking much about Sabbath. You already know that the Lord's Day, Sunday, is when we worship. And we don't have to, you know, be opening scriptures. Matthew 28 and Acts chapter 20, verse 7, and 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 2, and then he rose on the first day. You know, all that. we know all that, and our teacher has made that clear. What we want to look at from all these accounts is how they allowed tradition to be clouded their vision and to hinder their understanding of the gospel tonight. The message is overcoming traditions that hinder gospel penetration. Overcoming traditions that hinder gospel penetration. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, disregarding traditions that condemn the guiltless disregarding traditions that condemn the guiltless you know a child of god is happily living his life and is doing what he believes is right to be done and then he's guiltless in the sight of god but there are people that hold some traditions that will condemn him now most of the time when people condemn you you do not look at what they are condemning you for. You look at their stature. You look at their posture. You look at their height. And you look at their authority. And you feel condemned. And you cannot go and pray to God and say, God, forgive me because there's nothing to be forgiven. You have not done anything wrong. All you can do is that I am sorry, I am miserable now because so and so is condemning me. We need to grow up and disregard traditions that condemn the guiltless. Number two, disclaiming the thoughtless. The people who are thoughtless in their lives, they just know their forefathers have given this tradition to their fathers. Their fathers have given this tradition to them and their neighbors are observing this uh, Sabbath and they're observing this tradition. They might be dying. They will not rise up and go to the hospital. The hospital is too far away and when not to walk more than two miles or more than two kilometers on the Sabbath day, that's not in the world and so there are people that will say we don't have food at home and so we cannot rise up and go and get the food we do not have the hospital nearby and somebody is sick and today for them is a Sabbath day they cannot rise up and walk the distance because of their tradition you need to disclaim the thoughtlessness of people who do not value life 
they do not value your healing they do not value your progress all they want even if you were to die uh, there was uh, you know uh, somebody that got healed of blindness and she was uh, blind all her life and she came to uh, a crusade being held and the eyes were opened and then she went back home she was rejoicing at the search because it wasn't a christian in quotes it was of another religion and so they said where did you get uh, your eyes uh, open and she said i got my eyes open in that crusade they said and what do you think of that he said i've given my life to christ now i am born again they said, what a pity, it would have been better for you to have died in your blindness than to give up your religion. She said, you have your mind, I have my mind, you are thoughtless, you are not thinking of the grace that has come to me and of the miracle that I've received. You are thoughtless, I disclaim all your hold upon my life. We need to know, number two, disclaiming the thoughtless who contradict his goodness. He went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil. And they were thoughtless in their evaluation. He just, uh, you know, neglected them. Number three, deliverance through his touch to consummate God's glory, to exalt God, to uplift God, and to make us see that our God is still alive. And when people are saying in, the, in, the, in some parts of the world that their God is dead, the miracle, the signs, and the wonders, and the healings, whether it takes place on a Friday, on a Saturday, or on a Sunday, doesn't really matter. Those miracles, the divine touch that comes to people, consummates God's glory. Let's go to come to number one. Number one, disregarding traditions that condemn the guiltless. Three things we're talking about here. Number one, the waves of condemnation from the Pharisees. The waves, it came like waves of the sea and the storm. And it was coming every time and beating on the sheep of the gospel every time. The waves of condemnation from the Pharisees. Number two, the word of clarification. The word of clarification. Christ always had an illustration, always had a scripture, always had an event that happened in the Bible to clarify what had actually taken place. The word of clarification for the, for the Pharisee. The people who are still like the Pharisees today, Christ has explained everything, clarified everything. Look at number three, his withdrawal from the conspiracy of Phariseeism. Sometimes, you know, you have to withdraw. And there are times you have to withdraw from a particular situation physical, physically. There are times you have to withdraw your sight and your focus and your understanding from a particular situation. There are times you have to withdraw by just keeping quiet. You know, some people, they have seen, uh, you know, something great uh, taking place. And instead of rejoicing and praising the Lord, you see the days in which we live are very different from the days of old there were times if you want to say something about somebody for another person to hear you have to get up out of your house and you have to walk the distance and knock on door and say do you know this and this about that person but another time, uh, you know, the time uh, was getting faster. And if you were going to say anything to anybody, you have to write a letter and you have to post it. And that letter may take days, even weeks or months before getting there. And then later uh, they developed and then there was telegram. And now if you want to send information to somebody, you can send a telegram and that gets faster, but it will still take days. And then later, all 
these uh, new inventions and innovations that uh, technology now comes and now you can say something you know, by just sending a text or you can say something by going on social media and you write this and that and many many people will reach that now the catch is this it nowadays when you write something you know, that uh, is not true not you but you know when they write something you know, that is not true if you are going to respond to that that's what they expect you respond then they write again and the more and when you do that you make insignificant people traditional people erroneous people thoughtless people you make them significant because now you are replying to them others are commenting others are commenting you withdraw how do you withdraw? Just keep quiet and just act as if you never read what they wrote. It's withdrawal from the conspiracy of Phariseeism. Let's look at number one. Number one, we're looking at the waves of condemnation from the Pharisees. We're looking at Matthew chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn, the cornfield, and his disciples were unhungered and began to pluck the ears of corn and to eat in verse 2 then the pharisees were all around and when the pharisees saw it they said unto him now to start with the disciples knew that the pharisees were around the disciples knew that the pharisees were past comment the disciples knew that the Pharisees would always be looking for something to criticize. But they didn't hide. They didn't say, now, to avoid criticism, to avoid confrontation, and to avoid unnecessary condemnation, we're hungry, but to rather punish ourselves and not touch the cards. We know we can eat. We know it is not wrong, but we don't want any comment of the Pharisees. You know, in life, you'll never rise. You'll never succeed. You'll never go to the top if your life is always limited by the critics, by the people. They're always around, and then you see them... I don't want confrontation. I don't want criticism. I don't want any bad comment. You don't do anything good in life. But while they were there, the disciples said, we're looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Whatever Christ does not condemn, whatever does not bother Christ, and whatever Christ will approve of, we're going to do that. And so uh, they edge the corner, they, they ought to eat. Behold, the disciples do that which is not lawful to do on the Sabbath day. And it's good they talk to Christ because if they were wrong, Christ will not hide their error. He'll not hide their fault. He'll not hide their sin. But thank God that they spoke to Christ and Christ defended them. You didn't hear that one. You know, the accuser, Satan, is always there accusing the brethren day and night. They've done this, they've gone there, they've eaten this, they've dressed like this, they have appeared like this, and we don't worry about anything because Christ, our advocate, is by the right hand side of the Father, is always defending you. I said, He's always defending you. He defended them. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, we're told, But I say unto you that in this place, there is one greater than the temple, greater than the Old Testament covenant, and greater than those Pharisees and the Sadducees. How it is, uh, how it is uh, gracious, and how it is enlightening, uplifting, that we have one greater than all our accusers. And if the greater one is supporting you, there is no condemnation. 
and there is no oppression and there is no feeling guilty and there is nothing that will make you to a uh, return uh, to kind of a uh, go away from the world brother why are you not working well uh, my neighbors and the people they don't understand me i do everything i do in good faith but they think I am wrong. They look at me at that I'm wrong. And they comment that I'm wrong. Uh-huh. What next? That means because of them, I will not come out. I will not do anything. How could you do that? Christ will defend you. Christ will defend me. Look at John chapter 5, I'm looking at verse 8. John chapter 5, looking at verse 8. Here is where Jesus healed a man that had been sick and impotent and invalid. He had been an invalid for 38 years. And then Jesus saith unto him, Rise, take up thy bed and walk. In verse 9, we're told, and immediately the man was made whole and took up his bed and walked. And on the same day was the Sabbath. Now, what was important to the Pharisees is not that the man had been healed of 38 years of infirmity. What's important to them is that it was on the Sabbath day. It would have been better in their mind to leave that man suffering for the next weeks or years, whatever, rather than breaking their tradition that the hell so fast. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, the Jews therefore said unto him that was killed, it is the Sabbath day. Do you realize that? It is not lawful for thee to carry thy bed. Look at verse 11. In verse 11, he answered them, he that made me whole, he that made me whole. Now the Pharisees could not make anyone home. The Sabbatarians could not make anyone home. And the people that held to tradition, the traditionalists and their tradition could not make anyone whole, but Christ made him whole. He'll make you whole. Now you have to make your choice. Are you going to hold on to the truth? Christ is the truth personified. You shall know the truth, Christ, and the truth shall make you free. Or are you going to hold on to tradition, the tradition that cannot do any good in your life? I will hold on to Christ. He answered, to, he answered them, He that made me whole, the same said unto me, Take up thy bed and walk. And the man said, That's enough for me. That's enough for me. The one who has the power in heaven, on earth, and the one who has the power to destroy all the works of the devil, he said unto me, Rise up and walk. And his power infiltrated my life and touched my life, penetrated my life, and I'm walking. That's enough. Tradition begun. I said, let tradition go. Look at number two here. Number two, we're looking at the word of clarification for the Pharisaic. The word of clarification. We're looking at Matthew chapter 12 and reading from verse 3. But he said unto them, but he said unto them, now we must be like Christ, not pushed up, not intimidated, not have our mouth closed, and not have fear stop our mind from functioning. Now, fear has the tendency to make you forget what you have read, what you have known, what you have learned, sudden fear. And then you want to remember and to justify what you have done, you cannot remember because fear affects the mind. And fear affects your memory. And fear affects your motive. Fear affects everything. But Christ, of course, you know Christ, fearless, authoritative, anointed from heaven. And he, he, he calls us to himself so that we can have 
the might of Christ and the fear of Pharisees and the fear of traditional people will be cancelled from your life in Jesus name but he said unto them now he said with confidence if you are fearful and you open your mouth and you try to talk the fear will affect your tone of voice the fear will affect your body language the fear will affect your communication and interaction you'll not be able to stand you might look down you might look sideways you might look up but you'll not be able to look at the face of those Pharisees but Christ is true in his strength in his knowledge in his authority that's what is passing across to us that when those pharisees when they challenge us and they say don't you know we are here how could you allow your disciples to do that but he said unto them have you not read he said i live by the book i walk by the book i stand for the book do you have that same book that same bible that same word of god he said have you not read what david did when he was an hunger and they that were with him look at verse 4 it says in verse 4 how he entered into the house of god and did eat the showbread that was not lawful for him to eat neither for them that were with him but only for the priest then in verse 5 he said oh have you not read in the law how that on the sabbath days the priest in the temple profane the, uh, the, the the sabbath and uh blameless 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 no blame for my disciples they've not done anything wrong that the scripture condemns no guilt for my disciples they've not done anything that the scripture condemns and we need to have that understanding although maybe they, they said they read the scriptures if they wanted to answer christ they would say yes we have read yes we have read but there are people that read without understanding anytime they read their, tra their uh, tradition takes the better part of them and their tradition will not allow them to understand what they are reading. look at acts chapter 13 acts chapter 13 i mean in from verse 27 acts 13 verse 27 for they that dwell at jerusalem and their rulers because they knew not they knew him not nor yet the voices of the prophets which are read every sabbath day they have fulfilled them in condemning him they read the scriptures every sabbath day but their tradition will not allow them to understand the truth that they read in the scriptures but christ the word personified it gave them clarification all your doubts the lord will clear all the uh, condemnation of the pharisees uh, before they you know beat you down and make you to forget the real truth the lord will clarify everything in your life in jesus name look at number three there number three the withdrawal from the conspiracy of pharisaism the withdrawal you know there are people that have an idea that if you are standing in a particular place and fire is burning they have an idea you should stand there and stay there they say if you withdraw from danger if you withdraw from uh, the conspiracy of the traditionalists they say that means that your life is not matured yet that means you are not on top of the situation now christ is the perfect one and look at what he did in matthew chapter 12 uh, i'm reading from verse 14 where and then the pharisees went out and held a council 
a consultation, made a conspiracy against him, how they might destroy him. Destroy him. Strong word. He came to destroy the works of the devil. And there was still much time ahead of him to keep on destroying the works of the devil. And then he ought to go to the cross. And on the cross of Calvary, he will totally destroy, exterminate the works of the devil. For that generation, for the following generation, for the coming generation, until he comes again. Yet a longer distance dispensation and duty ahead of him to destroy the works of the devil and they made a consultation a council they were going to destroy him at that time look at verse 15 in verse 15 but when jesus knew it he withdrew himself from this he withdrew himself from this now, that's why Christ was asking, have you read the scriptures? What have you read in the scriptures? How did you read the scriptures? The prudent man foresees evil and hideth himself. Look at John chapter 8. We're reading from verse 58. John chapter 8, verse 58. It tells us, Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, before Abraham was, tell me, I am. Look at verse 59. Verse 59, then took they up stones to cast at him. But Jesus hid himself. Why? Because the prophecy is that they pierced my hands and they pierced my feet. It was to die for redemption. And that death was to be on the cross of Calvary. But they picked up stones they wanted to throw at him. Was he afraid of death? No. He was afraid of dying a wrong death. It would be wrong for him to stay there and then they stoned him and they killed him and then he will say i will die anyway no you'll not die anyway there is a kind of death or danger of god he should die on the cross and when he picked up stones he hid himself look at first kings chapter 17 in first kings chapter 17 i'm reading from verse 1 and elijah the tishmite who was of the inhabitants of gilead said unto ahab as the lord god of israel liveth before whom i stand there shall not be dew nor rain this year but at according to my word look at verse 2 and then in verse 2 and the word of the lord came unto him the word of the lord came unto him saying in verse 3 it says get thee hence and turn thee eastward and hide thyself there are people who are not listening to god all they're listening to they're listening to the comments of people they're listening to the expectation of people they say whatever and whoever ahab is there jezebel is there go show yourself to them the time had not arrived when the time arrived in chapter 18 god called elijah he said elijah Go show yourself unto Ahab. But at this time now God said unto him, Turn, turn thee eastward. Hide thyself by the brook Cherith that before, that is before John and Jeremiah. Reading from chapter 36. In Jeremiah chapter 36, we're looking at verse 19. Then said the princes unto Baruch, Go hide thee. Thou and Jeremiah, and let no man know where ye be. Uh -huh. Jeremiah, Jeremiah, I will make your face like an iron brass. They shall fight against you, but they will not prevail against you. I 
am with you. And since I have the promise of God, look at what the people are saying. Go hide thee, thou and Jeremiah, and let no man know where ye be. Look at verse 26 there. In verse 26, for the king commanded Jeremiah, the son of Ablik and Seraiah, the son of Azrael, and Shalamir, the son of Abiel, to take Baruch, arrest them, take them, the scribe, and Jeremiah the prophet, but the Lord heed them. The Lord heed them. Jesus said, have you not read the scriptures? Have you not read the word? If you have read the word, you will understand when there is a conspiracy, well, if the Lord wants you to go out there and still preach in spite of their conspiracy, that's all right. But if the Lord is saying, look at this, look at this, look at this, and the Lord himself at that time hides you in his pavilion because you still have something to do before the final home call and because the greater is yet to come in your life in your family in your profession and in the ministry the lord has called you to the the greater thing is still to come in jesus name and so christ withdrew himself from the conspiracy of phariseeism we're looking at point number two now point number two we're looking at disclaiming the thoughtless who contradict the is goodness. Three things we're looking at here. Number one, willful hearts hardened by rigid tradition, unbendable tradition. Rigid. Number two, with that hand healed is an example illustration of redemptive transformation and number three were drawn heritage from religious task masters let's look at number one here number one willful hearts hardened by rigid tradition we're looking at luke chapter six reading from verse six in luke chapter six verse six and it came to pass also on another sabbath that he entered into the synagogue and taught, and there was a man whose right hand was withered. Look at verse 7. In verse 7, and the scribes and the Pharisees watched him whether he would heal on the Sabbath day, that they might find an accusation against him. The Lord had not even healed the man. They were watching thoughtless people. They were watching traditional people, whether they will heal the man or not, so that they'll find accusation against him. Look at Matthew chapter 13, reading from verse 14. Matthew 13, verse 14. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, by hearing they shall hear and shall not understand. And seeing they shall see and shall not perceive. And then in verse 15, verse 15, for this people's heart is waxed gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes they have closed. Their eyes they have closed now you went out to the field you saw a beautiful flower and then you brought it to this man my brother look at this beautiful flower and the fellow closed his eyes i'm showing you something he closed his eyes it's beautiful and he closed his eyes what can you do there are eyes they have closed. You got an information. It's written. Either you saw it on the web, or you saw it social media, or you saw it in the newspaper. 
beautiful writing a kind of writing uh, that says now you are free and you come to the person in bondage and you say hey, let me show you something i saw something here and it's beyond comprehension this is good and the fellow closes eyes what can you do you've got salvation you've got healing you've got power and you are coming from the global crusade and you are jumping and running and you are excited and you come to somebody who had had a problem similar to the one that had been solved i want to show you something look at this video of somebody i cut it out for you of somebody having the same problem that you have and the fellow was healed and I know you will be healed and the fellow closes his eyes and he will not see what can you do there are people who are rigid in their tradition the people who are rigid with whatever they had known before as it was so it is and so will it ever be and they close their eyes what can you do it says their eyes they have closed lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be uh, converted and he and i should heal them that's why they were not converted they were rigid in their tradition let's come to number two here number two here we're looking at where that hand heals a symbol of redemptive transformation we're looking at luke chapter six and we're looking at verse eight but he knew their thoughts he knew their thoughts he knew their thoughts my brother my sister thoughts are very important if you think the same way you were thinking before you remain in the same place you remain you were before thoughts if life is going to change thoughts must change the inner talk that you have within yourself must change and your view your belief must change and your inner conversation with yourself must change but if it's the same old thought from the forefathers to the grandfather to the father and now it gets to you where grandfather's thought is thought made him stop there that's where you'll stop where your father's thought and he said a family never takes anything new this is what we have known this is what we always know this is the way we think and this is the way we always remain you're going to remain where they remain and so there's no point complaining we don't like the state of our family we don't like the height of our family we don't like the failure of our family what brought the family to that point of failure their thoughts their minds, their attitude, their disposition, their action, their habit. If we're going to get to the place where our forefathers did not reach, if we're going to get to the place where our neighbors have not reached, there is one thing that must happen. It's your thought. We're told here when he knew their thoughts, he said to the man which at the way that hand rise up you know it's going to be a day of transformation in your life when you don't live by the thoughts of the people around you look at them where are they where have they got to when radio came they said they're holy 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 christians they'll not choose radio they said if something is talking inside that radio inside that thing there transistor there they say there's a demon there they'll not choose radio they said when aeroplane came they said me i will not fly in an aeroplane why because according to them god has given us the earth and we remain on earth 
and the aeroplane is taking us to the sky. Uh -uh. I will not do that. That's their thought. That's how they remain there. When computer came, uh, not up to one century now, they said, computer, how can that be? They said, they will not use computer. And when all these uh, social media handles, when it came, they said, we need to be very careful now because anything uh, that will, you know, you put in something, something will come out. There is a picture somewhere and somebody will send that picture to you and will send that video to you. And within one minute, you've got it. It's even faster now because of, you know, it was started with 3G and then 4G and 5G. And technology is even going to 6G and it's going to transform and it's going to transform that thing to you in the split of a second. They said, no, 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 we're not going to use that. Their thoughts keep them away from what is happening and from what they want to make use of. Our thoughts will either move us forward or it will drive you back. Our thoughts will move us forward. I'm talking to somebody there. Your thoughts will move you forward in Jesus' name. My thoughts are not your thoughts, says the Lord God. And when you are born again, you want to leave your old thoughts, the thoughts that kept you down, and the thoughts that will not allow you to move forward. You want to abandon that. You think the thoughts of God. You will rise. You will soar. And you will go up in Jesus' name. Now, but she knew their thoughts and said to the man, which had the withered hand, rise up and stand forth in the midst. And he arose and stood forth. Uh -uh. Man with withered hand, don't you know what the temple people are thinking, synagogue people are thinking? Don't you know what tradition is thinking? Why did you stand up? They don't have with that hand. I'm the one having with that hand. Whatever they think, their thoughts will not hinder my healing. Whatever those people outside think, their thoughts will not hinder your healing in Jesus' name. And then we're told, look at that now. Luke chapter 6, look at verse 9. In verse 9, then said Jesus to them, I will ask you one thing. Is it lawful on the Sabbath days to do good or to do evil, to save life or to destroy it? Look at verse 10. In verse 10, and looking round about upon them all, didn't look down, live your life. Didn't look sideways, live your life. Don't be intimidated by the, by the presence of those Pharisees. You see one there, you see one there, and then what you wanted to say before, and what you wanted to declare before, and what you wanted to teach before, you cannot teach because those people are there. I will teach. I will teach. Now, how will your life be different? If you cannot say what you ought to say because of a Pharisee there, what makes you distinguished? What makes you have distinction? And what makes you so above is that you are able to do what you ought to do in spite of the Pharisees that are there. And that's what Christ is. And looking around about upon them all, he said unto the man, stretch forth thy hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored, and your life is restored, yes. and your health is restored, yes. and all the, all the limbs in the body, they are restored in Jesus' name, yes. whole as the other, whole as the other. One hand good, the other hand must be good. Yes. Brain must come alive. Hell's strength must come alive in the presence of those Pharisees, in the presence of those naysayers. Your life will now be whole. Look at number three. Number three here is 
withdrawn heritage from religious taskmasters. Withdrawn heritage from religious taskmasters. Look at Mark chapter 3 and I'm reading from verse 5 and when he had looked round about on them with anger what do you say? I don't understand that one Christ Jesus our Lord he looked round about on them with anger Jesus is the judge of the whole earth the Father has committed all judgment into his hand. And all these people that saw the truth and they still held on to tradition. God is angry with the wicked every day. And he, being the judge, the anger they will face on the final day. He gave them a foretaste of that in his look. When he had looked round about on them with anger, being grieved for the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, Stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched out, he stretched it out, and his hand was restored, whole as the other. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, and the Pharisees went forth and straightway to counsel with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Verse 7 And Jesus withdrew himself with his disciples. To the sea, to the seaside. I pray what we we'll learn when it comes to the time to apply it, the Lord will remind us in Jesus' name. And Jesus will draw himself. That's in your community, you hear a bomb blast. And then a house is collapsing, fire, smoke rising up. That's the time for you to understand that fire can spread from house to house. And then you get out. You withdraw yourself. They tell us in the airplane, you enter the plane and the hostess begins to make announcement. And they say, this is for your safety, your security. Should in case anything happens, then we'll open the door. They say, leave everything you've got in the cabin and just get out. Withdraw yourself from that place of danger in life. We need to look at that. And whenever there is something in that you cannot control beyond your control that will cut your life short you will escape yeah. with long life the lord will bless you yeah. and show you and give you a salvation redemption in jesus name yeah. we're coming to point number three point number three we're looking at deliverance through his touch to consummate God's glory. Three things. Number one, disease and infirmities of the sick. Number two, deliverance for incurables by the Savior. Number three, denunciation of insensitivity in the sanctuary. We're coming to number one disease and infirmities of the sick. We're looking at Luke chapter 13, reading from verse 11. And behold, there was a woman which had a spirit of infirmity, 18 years, and was bowed together and could in no wise lift up herself. Now, the understanding people have 
those who have gone to school, those who have studied science, those who have studied biology, and those who have studied uh, the microbes and all the neutrons and all the brain cells, those who have studied the, all the different parts of the body, the blood, the vessel, the sinew, the bone, and the joints and everything. They say, if you have arthritis, this is the cause. If you have the hotness of the body, this is the cause. If you have cancer, this is the cause. If you have a tuberculosis, this is the cause. If you have TB, this is the cause. They put all the causes causes on natural things. They put all the causes, all the reasons for all the sicknesses everywhere. They put it on uh, is this cell, the multiplication of this cell and the, uh, the, muti the mutilation of this cell. They say that is what is happening. But you know here, the spirit of infirmity. Satan causes sickness. We see that from Job. And then evil spirits, they cause sickness. We see that from all the people that Jesus drove out, the spirit, and they were healed. And this woman had been bent over all these 18 years, bowed together, and could in no wise lift up herself. That's the reason why when Christ gave the disciples power, he gave them power to heal the sick and to cast out devils because some of those sicknesses are caused by evil spirits the infirmities of the people that have uh, sicknesses look at verse 16 in verse 16 and ought not this woman being a daughter of abraham look at this look at this whom satan has bound whom satan has bound Do, look these 18 years be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day if anything binds you. If anything causes sickness in your life today, let them be cast out in Jesus' name. You will be well. You will be made whole. And all the activities of demons and evil spirits there, they are cancelled in your life in Jesus' name. Let's look at number two here. Number two, we're looking at deliverance for incurables by the Savior. Deliverance for incurables. Nothing incurable through the name of Jesus. That name will set you free. Set your wife free. Uh, nothing man is lower than and then set your husband free and all your children your parents the lord in his power set them free in jesus name deliverance what do you have what are you going to have deliverance for incurables by the savior luke chapter 13 i'm reading from verse 12 and when jesus saw her he called her to him and said unto her, Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. Where is the woman there? Woman, thou art loosed from thine infirmity. Any man there? Man, you're loosed from your infirmity. When Jesus says so, it is done. In your life, it is done woman thou art loose from thine infirmity and then in verse 13 in verse 13 and he laid his hands on her and tell me the next word there tell me tell me immediately she was made straight and glorified god look at verse 16 in verse 16 ought not this woman Luke chapter 13, verse 16. Luke chapter 13, reading from verse 16. In Luke chapter 13, verse 16, ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, 
a daughter of Abraham, a child of God, a woman that has believed on the Lord, a child of God, ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, be loosed from this infirmity on the Sabbath day, and since you are a child of God, and you have come into the kingdom at such a time like this, you are loosed in Jesus' name. You are delivered in Jesus' name. That's what Christ did, and we're told Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we're told in Acts chapter 10, reading from verse 38, Acts chapter 10, reading from verse 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power, who went about doing good, is going about tonight, he'll do good in your life. He'll do good in your body. Who went about 